We're in this series called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Temple, and it is about the Songs of Ascent, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, and we chose eight of those. The way we did it was very um, scientific. It was the eight that Andrew McCain could sing. And so that's how we chose those songs um, out of those. Uh, and as he says, the others were boring anyway. So anyway, we, we look at the, we're looking at these eight psalms, and really what they are is a narrative, and they're really the only narrative in the psalms, um, of what people do when they would go up, that these are the songs that they would sing when they would go up to the temple for the three major feasts um, for the Israelite people. Now, these psalms, starting in 120 and going to 134, are a process of healing. They start out, you're far away from God, and there's this kind of this process of renewal and a process of kind of connecting to who God is. And that's how that goes. Now, some of you might know that today, this Sunday, is the first Sunday of Advent. Now, the word Advent um, is an old word. It's, you know, it's a Latin, it comes from a Latin word, but it means coming. And um, w- the Advent season is four weeks or four Sundays before Christmas and Christmas. And it's a time that the church through history has stopped and reoriented itself on the birth of Jesus. So the process of Advent is as a community and as an individual, you take time to focus on the birth of Jesus. Okay, And so you begin to contemplate and reorient yourself towards this amazing event that happened 2,000 years ago, which is the God of the universe was born of a woman, which is crazy. And that birth transformed everything. Every, every, everything. But as Christians, there's just one more thing. You see, we don't just look back at the birth of Jesus. We're also looking forward to the return of Jesus. And so it's not just us reorienting ourselves and thinking about the impact of the birth of Jesus on us, but it's also us reorienting ourselves and kind of sitting in what the Hebrew people would have been sitting in as they waited for the Messiah. The Advent is a reminder that we have not arrived, but that we are actually still waiting for everything to be made new. We're still waiting for something big to happen. Now in the um, Psalms of Ascent, it's traditional for Psalm 131 through 134 to be the Psalms that are used for Advent. So we lucked out. But I want you to taste a little bit of that waiting because if we're going to kind of re, if my job as your pastor tonight is to reorient you and to remind you as to what we're waiting for, what we're hoping for, what Christmas actually really is all about for us, I think we have to start in Revelation chapter 21, which is my favorite chapter. It's at the end of the Bible. It's John speaking about a vision. And this is what he says, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautiful, dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water, the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. There are two beautiful pictures that are 
painted in here. One is that the thing that you and I are waiting for is justice. The thing that you and I, when we look at the birth of Jesus and we look at how God has delivered us, the thing that should kind of be pricked in us is that we're still waiting for justice. We're still waiting for evil to be fully conquered. And the second thing here that we're waiting for is to stop crying. To stop the pain. To stop the decay. To stop the brokenness. To to be in eternal relationship with God. To have everything made new for a grace to pour over us for eternity. This is what we're waiting for. Now, what's really exciting about Advent is that you and I get this opportunity to do something that a Hebrew person would not get to do. And that is, if when we reflect on the birth of Jesus, we're moved to His death and His resurrection and the fact that the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all of us. And so because you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're not, this is your opportunity, but if you have the Holy Spirit, if God is with you, then as you interact husband and wife, friend and brother and sister, and as employee and employer, as you function in this world, and as you wait and as you focus on God, you are able to give people a taste of the way it's supposed to be. You get an opportunity to say, to point to Revelation 21. When they interact with you as you are focusing on Jesus, they get a little taste of Jesus They get a little taste of justice. They get a little taste of the way it's supposed to be, the way it's going to be. And that's that's super exciting. You should be really, really excited. You get this mystical experience of offering people a taste of the end. And that's what I believe Advent is to remind us of as we begin to focus on Jesus. Now, and His birth. In Advent... You like candles. These candles represent so many different things. Um, So this time this year, we have four purple candles. And this one we're going to light today is usually the prophecy candle or the candle of hope. But all four candles in general represent preparing for the birth of Christ in some way. Okay. So tonight we're in Psalm 131. And so if you would turn to that. Now Psalm 131 and 130 are very are connected in the narrative because we're nearing the temple. This is a journey to the temple. This is a journey to getting closer to God because this is where God is. He's in the temple. You're getting closer. There's this process of healing. And so last week, Rod talked a lot about forgiveness, And if you read Psalm 130, what you begin to get is the sense of how overwhelmed one person can become with their sin the closer they approach the holiness of God. And that there becomes this desperateness for forgiveness and a desperateness for God's grace. Now, if you walk with God for any length of time, what you know is that the closer you get to God, you don't, on one hand, you feel God's grace and His forgiveness, but on the other hand, you are made so keenly aware of your own sin. And so you get that sense of things in Psalm 130 when the writer is saying you, you need to watch for God like the watchman on the wall waits for God. Like there's, there's this alertness because you want to be transformed. You want that sin to be removed, right? And you become more keen about that process. And so in Psalm 130, there's this call at the end for Israel to put their hope in God, and this theme is going to continue in 131. So let me read Psalm 131 to you. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore.
I'm curious, how many of you were born between 1980 and 2000? Just out of curiosity. All right, about half of you. How many of you were born in the 70s? Okay. 60s? All right. 50s? 40s? All right. You got, I think that's 30s. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're not there. So you can get a little demographic. I think uh, the the 2000 to to uh, or the 1980s 2000 is about half of you. But there's some things about you guys that that are interesting because you're one of the most studied generations. And um part of that's because you are part of the electronic age and you you've never remember there not being some kind of technology or computer, right? So here are the depressing things about you guys. Um you have the most anxiety and the most fear, and one of your greatest things that you all wrestle with, according to most of the research, is you're all terrified of missing out. Now, I would say that's probably true for most of us, but it's definitely true for you guys between 1980 and 2000. The Generation Y and the Generation, the Millennials, there is a loneliness, an anxiety, and a fear you're going to miss out. Right? And that seems to be something that kind of grips all of us. In fact, as a pastor, I feel like every Sunday what I say is, now I know all of you are anxious, right? That's one of the things, because I spend a lot of time talking to you, that there's an anxiety in all of us. This particular psalm is a psalm that's one of the more ancient ones within this set of song of songs of ascent. It's written by David. And really what it is is a psalm of a statement, it's a statement of how you are to be or how you should be as you enter into the presence of God. And that David is encouraging the community with whom is singing this into the temple to have a particular way of being. And the first thing that he says is, my heart is not proud, O Lord. Now, some of us think that pride is like, oh, hey, I'm so good, I'm awesome. Most often, pride is just anxiety. Because you see, anxiety is a belief, no matter, even if you have kind of a physiological experience, it is built on a belief that you have some kind of control in this world. And if you believe that you have some kind of control in this world, then you are proud. And anytime you kind of see this phrase in the Old Testament, it's usually written like this, My heart is not proud, O Lord, because the statement is basically this. I am not God. God, I want you to know I'm not you. That's what David is introducing us to. I want you to know that I'm not you. Now, it's important to understand this. We're going to see two words in here, heart and soul. And it's confusing in the English because we don't know what a heart or a soul is when people are talking about my heart being proud and my soul being this. And we're like, I don't know. Every time you see heart, it is the inner part. right? So it's your emotions, it's your mind, it's the thing that makes up your inner life. Okay. So what he's saying is inside of me, the way I think, the way I feel, I do not have this sense that I'm the one in charge. That I have some ability to control things. Right? Now, the next line, it says, My eyes are not haughty. Proverbs 6, one of the things that Solomon says that God hates the most is haughty eyes. But literally, this word means to lift your eyes upward. Okay? To look up. To look around. So, what David is saying is, I am not God, you're God, and I am not looking anywhere else. Okay? Now, here's the reason that most of us are anxious, and most of us have anxiety, and most of us are proud. It is because we are, we have bought into the consumerist world and into the voyeuristic world. Okay? Like, We consume other people's lives and we consume things. 
Now, it's, to live is to consume. You, that's, you have to, right, to, to be alive. But here's how it used to work a long time ago. You had to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses lived next door. The Joneses probably, if they made more money than you, they didn't make much money, more, more money than you. Maybe their kid had a nicer car, a bike, and you had, and they had two cars. There wasn't a lot for you to keep up with. But right now, the thing that you and I are trying to keep up with is the rest of the world, is the 1% of the world, who takes pictures of themselves on Instagram and Facebook, who shares their, we all share our experiences. So we've gone to the place where it's not just that we're consuming possessions, and wanting more, we're consuming other people's experiences. So when we see somebody celebrate Thanksgiving and they take all these pictures and we're like, oh, I wish I was there. I, that's, I mean, why didn't I get to? Or some cool Christmas or they're taking pictures in front of their car or like we begin to consume their things and their experiences. We begin to envy. Our eyes become haughty. We begin to look at other things. But the reality is all of us, even villagers who we try to be more sensitive, I suspect, to these things, we are caught up in this consumerist world. So here's some more of those stats. I'm sorry, 1980 to 2000, but here are your stats. You spent, women who are in between there spend 10 hours on their phone a day on average. Guys, eight hours. So there's this consumption of images going on, right? Women, I don't know the stats for men, and I'm sorry about this, but the stats for women in between this demographic, buy, they buy one pair of clothing a week, or 50 pairs of clothing a year. Okay? Right? There's this constant, I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, the amount of electronics and all, we're consuming things. My son, he got this really nice video game about 15 days ago, and then we were going to Bookman's to buy some puzzles, and he was talking about how he wanted another video game that was just like that one, but better. Right? But when we, we laugh, and I told him, you know, he needed to learn about delayed gratification and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that's all of us. Right? We're all in that place. And so, what David is saying is that for you and I, the approach that we need to have is that our eyes, and this is for Advent, have to be focused on baby Jesus. Our eyes have to be focused on Christ. And we can't look up. We can't look up. But we spend our life looking up and looking around. And what happens is, as soon as we begin to do that, we begin to believe that we have control and that we're missing out. So we're in control and we're missing out. And then David kind of illustrates this a little bit more. He says, I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Now when you read that, you think, what, so David's just like a shallow thinker? Like he's like, eh, I don't want to talk about that. That's not what he's talking about. Actually, if you kind of look at the language, it's the word concern is the word for walking around like a general. And so what he's saying is, I don't go around to God's ideas and inspect them. I'm not going, you know, like how a general inspects his troops. He's saying, what I don't do is I don't go to God's ideas and I say, oh, good job, God. Nope, nope, that wasn't right. No, you need to readjust that. No, I don't like how you're operating things here. Right? I'm not God's judge. Is what he's, I'm not God's inspector, is what he's saying. So he's saying, I've come to this place out of Psalm 130 where I have confessed my sin, where I'm at a place where, here God, this is the state that I want to be in. I am not proud. I'm not God. I'm not looking at other things. And I've come to a place in my life where I can say, your ways are better than my ways. I don't need to inspect them. And I don't necessarily need to understand them all. That doesn't mean you shouldn't ponder them. You shouldn't marvel at them. But you're not the one who's shaping them. So he goes on to kind of give us a picture of this in verse 2. 
But I have stilled and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So, those of you who have breastfed, you know what a two and three month year old is like. Um, when they want to eat, they want to eat. They're not content. Right? There is a definite not contentedness there. They feel a hunger. They want to eat. They cry until they eat. Right? That's kind of how, but the picture here is of someone who's with their mother and is content just to be there, right? To just stand there with their mother, knowing that things will come when they need to come. Now, this word soul will help you out here. Anytime you read soul in the Old Testament, just think whole person. Okay? External and internal. So the heart is just the internal. The soul is the external and the internal. The whole person. So what he's saying is, okay, what I've done is I have physically quieted myself and I am content. Now, I don't know about you, but being content is not an easy thing to do. I feel like just in the way that I am created, that I am driven to find the next thing and to consume the next experience and to have my house be just a little different and to have my bank account just a little bit bigger and I constantly go on and on. And there's, it's very difficult. And so I think, okay, well, I'll solve all those problems. I'll mentally adjust and, and I'm okay with that. And then it's just simple things. I'm not content with the fact that my son can't completely clean his room the way I want him to. Like, I think there's nothing that I can find contentedness in, it seems. Like, if it's just left up to me. But, Paul kind of helps us understand how you and I might get to be a weaned child. How we might find our contentedness as we enter into the presence of God. And he does a great job because he kind of illustrates this whole thing. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. I'm just going to read it to you. You listen, and I'll make a few comments. Because he kind of just tells us how to do it. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, most of us might say, oh, we're not into getting rich. We just want to be comfortable. And that's usually... but, but I think it's really telling that last line as an illustration of all of us. As we look at Facebook, as we, look, as we consume other people's lives and as we can, are part of the consumption culture, we are pierced with many different griefs. There's a lot of pain. And Paul's saying, this is, this is nothing new. And in verse 11, he tells you how to deal with it. But you, man of God or woman of God, flee from all this. Flee. Now, I want you to think about that in context of Advent. Because as we walk into focusing on the birth of Jesus, the other thing we begin to focus on is what we're going to get each other and what we're going to get for Christmas and the rigmarole of this person needs a present, that person needs a present, who gets a present, why do you have a present? Let's just buy a cow and give it to somebody in Mexico or I don't know, Africa. Right? We, we, we have this, like, this thing and we lose sight. And yet what Paul says, if we're going to be people who are transformed, if we're going to be people who are like a wean child, if we're going to be people who can say, I'm not proud, I don't have haughty eyes, and I'm not in a place where I'm telling God how he should do stuff, then I have to flee. 
So the question is, what is God in Advent asking you to flee from? To flee from something is not to just turn your back and mosey on away. Fleeing from something is running, right? When the bully comes to beat you up, you flee, right? You run away most of the time. So the first thing is to flee. But the fleeing is not just to run away to nothing. The fleeing is to pursue something. He says, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Righteousness is to to pursue what is right. But verse 12 is what I want you to hang on to here. He says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life, which is your relationship with God, to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep the command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in the in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be the honor and the might forever. Amen. Peter's like, if you just, I mean, Paul's like, if you just forgot, let me tell you who you should be pursuing. But what's really important in this passage, I think, and I think it's the key to contentment, is for you to take hold of eternal life. I think taking hold of eternal life means that you have to take hold of the story of your salvation. I think this is really important. In Hebrews chapter 2, it talks about us holding on to our story so that we don't drift away. That when you and I forget our story of how we came into the kingdom of God, when we're not telling people, we drift away. We don't take hold of our salvation. That's a really powerful thing. So here in Advent is the thing I want to offer you. Here's what contentment looks like. Contentment is brought about when you begin to feel anxious or whatever it is, begin to step into the craziness of consumerism in our world, that you begin to narrate to yourself and those around you how you came into the kingdom of God. Okay. So my assignment for you this week and practicing to be a wean child with your mother, it's for you to begin to retell your story of how you came to Christ. Now, if you grew up in a Christian family, then you have a really rich story. If you came to Christ later in life, you have a rich story, but you've got to keep telling it. It's not about standing up in front of people and giving your quote-unquote testimony. It's remembering how you came into the kingdom of God. Because when you lose sight of that, you lose sight of who God is and you begin to drift away and you begin to look at other things and you begin to judge the way God does stuff and you become, there's a discontent and an anxiety and a fear. Now, David, the psalmist, ends the psalm with a really short line. He says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. There's a change in this psalm. First thing he's saying is, I do this and I do that and this is my experience of things. And then all of a sudden, just like Psalm 130, he says to Israel, put your hope in God. Put your hope in the Lord. I think this is really important for us to understand that our salvation and our hope and our life in God is not an individual thing. Yes, you make a decision for Christ, but your salvation is not about just you. It's about all of us. When I say that I am not proud, I say it with all of you. We as a community say we are not proud. Our eyes are not haughty. We sing it together because by ourselves it is impossible. We have to say it together. You might notice that when we sing music here, often it's in third person, or if there is an I in it, it shifts to we very quickly. And the reason for that is, is because we want you to know that your faith is not a journey by yourself, but it is a journey together. Your hope is not 
Oh, my hope, I feel this certain way. It is our hope together for something. Now, hope means here in this text, what he's saying to Israel is he's saying, Oh, Israel, when there is pressure to do otherwise, trust God. And trusting God is being willing to be impacted by God. So I want to leave you with a picture of what he's asking for here. When a parent decides it's time to go home and they have a two-year-old who's having a ball here at church, maybe, and they don't want to go home, and they say to the child, it's time to go home, there are two kinds of responses. If they say to the child, it's time to go home and I'm going to carry you to the car, If the child opens its arms and is like, all right, pick me up, that's what's being asked here. Okay, That's what trust is. That's what hope is. So, But the other thing is that maybe that parent will say, hey, it's time to go home and pick you up, and that child starts squirming, screaming, and running. Right? Because they don't want to go home. And so they get picked up, and they're kicking, and they're thrashing. And that changes the relationship with God. Right? or with that parent. If the child just wants to be held and you can put him in the car seat, well, you feel good about your kid and you think you're a great parent. If the kid is screaming and squirming and kicking, you don't feel good about your kid and or yourself and you think you're not a good parent and you need to figure out how to discipline them right and and you have all these thoughts going through. God doesn't think that. He's got it figured out. But there is a relational issue here. And so what... David is asking of the community of Israel, and so through that asking us, is to be a people as a community who puts our hope in God, who is willing to turn to God and say, okay, I'm not proud. I don't have haughty eyes. I'm okay with where I'm at. Pick me up and take me where you're going to go. Okay, And that is the message of Advent. That is the, the process of reorienting. That's what we're about. That's what we're starting as we begin to focus on Jesus. It's to hear David calling us to sing this song as a community, as as a community, we turn our eyes on Jesus. Okay? And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to listen to this song be sung. And if you know it, you can sing along. If you don't know it, you can just listen. But... Andrew is going to sing in Hebrew and in English to us. And what I say every time is I ask you to kind of remove the resistance that you might have to allowing the music to impact you, allowing the words to impact you. Because I really believe that as we've gone through this year as a church and we've said the whole purpose of this community is to heal the city one person at a time. That this time of Advent and this time of of the Psalms of Ascent has been a time of healing for our community. And it's an opportunity for God to shave some of the, the resistance you have in your heart to Him. To focusing on Him and not raising your eyes. And so, I would just ask that you allow the ancient words to be sung over you And then if you know the English, you can sing along. He's going to sing Psalm 131, and then they will also sing the psalm that we're going to do next week, Psalm 133. And as you reflect on that, I just want you to ask the question, God, what are you asking me to flee this Christmas season? And what are you asking me to pursue? Okay? I'm going to hand out the offering as um, Andrew comes up and as Susan comes up. I'll pass this around. If you're visiting with us, we're just happy to have you. This is how the village keeps the lights on and makes pays their pastors and pays for food and all those good things. If the last person would put that basket under their seat, that would be fine. I'm going to ask that you don't come up for communion until the two songs are done. Um, but let me just offer communion to you and then when those two songs are done the band will get up and sing there'll be some other meditative music 
Um, and you can come up and take communion. But for us, communion begins with God, with bread, and it's God's body broken for you. For all of you. And then it ends with a glass of juice, which represents Christ's blood shed for all of you. So if you can come up here and say, I stand with Christ's body broken for me, and His blood poured out for me, that you would, I would just ask you to come up and, and take communion and remember. If you can't say that, then, then don't do that. Okay? Um, pastors aren't going to serve it this, this week, so you can just come up when you would like to come up. And Andrew's going to sing and talk. <laughs> uh, well, now I understand why I have so much fear of missing out. I don't know if you guys are like this, but sometimes I wonder if back at Kid Vespers, there's some fun going on that I'm missing out on. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to tell a quick story about, um, I guess, fleeing anxiety. Um, if you, has anybody ever been on uh, a prayer retreat with John and Patty? I went on the one a couple of months ago. Uh, Hannah was there. Mark was there. Sue was there. Um, and it was my first time on a prayer retreat like this. And I, I, I describe it as a freestyle prayer or freestyle offering. Basically, it's you kind of offer as you're led a verse or a prayer or a, a confession or whatever you feel like God's putting on your heart. And for me, that is a recipe for anxiety because I want to know the expectations. I want to do well. When, uh, when, when is it, when do I go and what do you want me to say? And so I can say that and I can be good. Um, I don't know. Uh, this was before we started our Songs of Ascent series and, uh, throughout the retreat, the pe- people kept offering, uh, Psalms of Ascent. Um, with, I wasn't at my prodding, but I was, re- it was just really interesting to hear uh, of all the 150 Psalms there are. This uh, out of this section of 15 psalms, people kept offering them, and they kept offering a lot of the psalms. Like Eric said, I put eight to music, and of the eight that I put to music, about five or six were actually offered by people independent of me. Um, so I was I was taking note of this, and I was sitting there wondering, like, when somebody offered a psalm, like, should, well, should I, I? I put some music to that. Should I share it? I don't know. Do I offer this? Is it the right time? Is it just me that wants to offer this? Is God inviting me to offer this? This is stressful. Um, and so, uh, the first night, uh, I finally, I finally worked up the courage. I was like, okay, if someone says another song of ascent, I'm going to sing it. I'm going to do it. And someone 10 minutes later said another song of ascent, read the Psalm. And I was like, just got, I right, guys, I, I, I can sing that in Hebrew. Is, is that okay? Should I, can I do that? And, uh, so I did and it was well received and I just thought, ah, oh, okay, that's good. All right. So maybe, maybe if another one comes up, I'll do it. And the next morning, another song came up, and it was actually Psalms 131. And I think Adrian, uh, wherever she is, there she 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 read it. And so I was like, "All right, I know I'm doing it." When I jumped in, I was like, "You know, I can I can sing that song too. I don't I mean to sing a lot. I could, but I could do it." And uh, and John, who who was kind of running everything, he said, "Well, why don't you uh, why don't we hold off on that? Why don't you offer that a little bit later?" And um, so immediately, I just got really quiet. I just started kind of, and I, because he said that, and what I heard was, well, that's a stupid idea. Well, I, Andrew just ruined prayer retreat, guys. We got a talker now. He's just going to want to keep talking. Well, well, look at what I can do. <laughs> and so I, I just, and then I just retreated inward, and I was basically, qu- I shut down. I was like, well, I mean, apparently there were rules that I didn't know about. <laughs> and uh, I basically, I, for the next four hours, I didn't say a word. And I was like, I'm not. Well, that's it. I mean, it's too risky to talk. You, you know, you get shot down. And I mean, all John said was just maybe offer that in a little bit. Let's linger here and you can sing that later. But I heard what I heard because, you know, some of my own wounds. Um, so then later on in the afternoon, we have a, a kind of time to ourselves. And so I went on a walk and I was just, I was anxious and I was a little upset. I was like, God, you totally set me up. Like you knew I was anxious and you knew I was like, I didn't know like whether it's me, whether you want me to offer it. I don't know what to do. Uh, and then you have the song of ascent come up. And so I tried and then I got shot down and I, why, why are you doing this? Um, and then actually I felt like God answered me like, cause we got to deal with some things. I, I did. I totally set you up. Uh, and I don't know. So then he, he started to, he showed me in this, like uh, just a, a, beha- a cycle, you know, rejection is a deep wound for me. And when I feel even, I, I don't know, pick up even the whiff of rejection, I pull back. I'm like, it's not safe. I'll only offer if it's definitely safe. 
So he, he basically started, you know, talking to me about this and I was still, I was really anxious and I was just still kind of like, what? I mean, come on, what, what, so what am I supposed to do about that? And, um, and then I felt like he was telling me to go talk to John, which was really just to say, Hey, I, I kind of, you know, I, I got my feelings hurt when you said that. I know you didn't mean it, but just so I could like get rid of the live rejection, but I was still really anxious about it. And we're still kind of going back and forth out on, on my own. Probably, I hope there was no one nearby because I was totally talking to myself out loud and just walking around and pacing. But I guess as, as we were talking, then I felt kind of God say, hey, can we, let's talk about something else for a little bit. Like, I felt like he, he said, you know, he and I, I gave me a picture of me as a kid and he was inviting me up into his lap as my father and wanting to tell me stories. Um, and so I could, I saw myself, imagine myself as a little kid and I was climbing up into his lap and just kind of looking up at him and saying, Hey, dad, tell me about the time you set Israel free from slavery in Egypt. That's always been one of my favorite stories. And I, I love story, period. Um, but that's a story of freedom from slavery, freedom from bondage and God's love for us and his compassion for us. And so I just sat, sat there and I like sat in his lap, imagined myself with my head just rested on his chest and say, and dad, tell me about the time you freed Israel from slavery. And then I imagined him saying to me, well, it was a long time ago and my people were hurting and I heard their cries and I'd had enough and I wanted to deliver them. Um, and I just, I, I walked around for the next 30 minutes and I told myself the story of the Exodus from Egypt as if God would, like my father was telling me this story and telling me what he did. And then I thought, you know, t- tell me about the time when I was lonely and you met me. When I was lonely and you sent me friends or you, and you sent me just your presence and you comforted me. And I just imagine myself sitting there like you would as a kid, like, dad, tell me a story. Um, like Eric was saying, like now Advent's a time we folk, we kind of, we think about God's story. Um, and we, he was challenging us to think about our story where, when, when God met us, where we welcomed him into our hearts. Um, and so that'd be something to say, like, you know, God, tell me about the time when you broke through to me, uh, when you spoke to my heart, got a hold of my heart. Um, cause I know it's, it's just a, it's an, it's an interesting exercise for me. And just that like picture of rest, like where you come to him as a kid, you don't have to figure everything out. I know. I have the tendency to overanalyze everything and that just produces more and more anxiety. If I have a wound, sometimes I want to go and I want to dig around in it or I go hunting for sin. When so much healing happens when we hear how much God loves us. And that's that what that's at the bottom of it. What we all want to hear is how much God loves us. So imagine myself crawling up into God's lap and just asking him, God, tell me how much you love me. Tell me that you delight in me. Tell me who you are and how strong you are and how loving and tender you are. And tell me who I am. Tell me what you made me to be. Um, And so much healing happens there. And that's that place like where we come to him like a weaned child, where we're not striving, but we're abiding in him, just resting and abiding in him. We don't have to have everything figured out. We don't have to overanalyze ourselves. And we don't have to go digging through our wounds or digging up old sin to be good. But just rest in him and ask us to tell, ask him to tell us how much he loves us. Um, so that's what this song is about for me. That place of resting where God can say how much he loves us and what he invites us into, which is to abide in him.